Hey everyone, Delve here. You can check out my channels here. Today I've decided I'm going to try to do more in-depth reviews for games, instead of simply covering them briefly. The truth is that these short reviews don't do the games justice, and it's sort of a waste of my time to not really get into the details of the games if I'm going to go through the trouble of playing them. So without further ado, we're going to start with Dark Souls 2 itself. The, this is the sequel to Dark Souls, obviously, and so the overall gameplay pattern is roughly the same. It's a lot of the same ideas. I'm going to get into what I call the main progression engine. This is a concept which roughly correlates to what choices or behaviors advance you through the game. One key facet of a game like this is that there's obviously dodge rolls, which are a matter of practice. It goes without saying that a degree of the game's substance is knowing enemy attacks and responding to them appropriately. Dodge rolls and other timing related components I will henceforth describe as being execution based mechanics. This is sort of the main alluring component of Dark Souls, it's kind of the defining characteristic and there's not much to say about it other than I think that it's a really good system for Dark Souls. I think it's very unique, I think it's very fascinating, I think it, it's uh, really interesting for a lot of people. And I'd even go so far as to say is it's not too demanding either. It's actually pretty reasonable. Maybe some people will struggle with the execution-based mechanics, but as far as I understand, anybody who's really committed to trying to understand them will gain some purchase in the system. I think it's not a system that's too difficult. I think some games, like maybe The Binding of Isaac, are too execution-based. I think that's not true for Dark Souls. I think it just looks very demanding in an execution sense, but I think it's really not that demanding. So my opinion is, if you want to play a hard video game, hard TM, right, like, you're not actually interested in playing the most brutal video game possible, but you're interested in playing a hard enough video game, I think Dark Souls is a fantastic option, right? Especially Dark Souls 2. I think Dark Souls 2 is also really good for that. So, like I said, you know, you want a hard video game that you know is hard, come to Dark Souls. It's a great time. But anyway... So even though this game is an RPG, you can fully expect to be consistently involved in direct dodging of enemy attacks. These execution-based mechanics are what's so fascinating, like I said. And it's interesting because they're fascinatingly interwoven with the RPG mechanics. Which brings us to the main component of character progression, and that's the stats. How this relates to the execution-based mechanics is actually quite interesting, and it's a critical piece of the substance of the execution-based gameplay. Now there are nine stats within Dark Souls 2, and they can be roughly categorized into two main groups, offensive stats and then support stats. This is arbitrary, I just came up with this, right? It's not a thing that's in the game, just keep that in mind. The damage stats are fairly self-explanatory. These are stats that just increase your damage, and they're typical fantasy fare. Stats like strength and intelligence do the exact kinds of things that you would expect them to do. Uh, the main area of interest in this case is in the other stats, because these ironically have much more to do with the game's systems. Now I will cover the offensive stats in their own videos, each one of them deserves their own video in my opinion, um, but we'll talk about these support stats right now. So first we have Vigor, which basically just increases your health. Funnily enough, most stats actually increase your HP by a small amount anyway, so the stat feels sort of like an afterthought. It's not really, it doesn't really do that much yet it's undeniably effective in the long term. The problem is more in the execution, because you would need to have an absurd amount of game knowledge to know how much health exactly you would need to survive certain kinds of attacks. So practically, it's a great stat to start increasing whenever you have no other stats to put points into. It also caps out at 50. That's another one of the things about these games, is that these stats usually have something known as a soft cap, these are breakpoints at which increasing the stat becomes less effective. So for example, Vigor increases health by 20 points per level between about 20 and 50, but drops down to increasing health by only 5 after 50 points. This is something I'm just sort of used to as it relates to these games. All of these games have this, uh, but it's not exactly a friendly system to new players who may erroneously assume that getting a stat to 99 is worth it, when that is something that is practically never worth doing. As a general rule, most stats should be brought to their relevant soft caps, and then usually a better idea to begin putting points into other stats which have not yet reached their soft caps. That's one of the main defining characteristics of this video game, and of, of the Dark Souls video games in general. So this is true for basically all the stats I'll cover, both offensive and support. The next stat is Endurance. This is one of the more defining stats of this game, 
The stat primarily increases your stamina, which is a crucial link between the statistical and execution-based mechanics of this game, because it governs how many attacks or dodge rolls you can perform. The problem is very similar to that of health, in that it would require an exceptional amount of game knowledge to make heads or tails of exactly how much stamina would be optimal in any given scenario, right? Like, you have to know in advance, oh, I need this much stamina to kill this enemy, or I need this much stamina to dodge this many attacks and then attack back in response, right? But Endurance also soft caps at 20, so it is kind of almost irrelevant. I don't personally know of a reason to push Endurance past that soft cap, uh, even with some of the most stamina intensive weapons in the game, but perhaps there could be some specific cases where that would make sense. But it's difficult for me to justify mentally when the game is so chock full of great stats to soft cap, uh, as well as the fact that many offensive stats can also be used in tandem for even more damage. So maybe in PvP or something more stamina makes sense. Maybe if you're using certain kind of weapons and you just want a little extra stamina, that's something you could do. But generally, I think stamina should cap out at about 20 for most players. I don't see a reason to push it past that. So next we have Vitality. This is the stat which governs equip load or how much armor and how many weapons you can have equipped at once. Note that rings also have a weight in this game. Armor and heavier weapons aren't bad, but this stat is far from being the best in the game, especially when there is a ring that rewards you heavily for keeping this stat low. That's called the Flynn's Ring. So it rewards you, it literally rewards you for having a low vitality. It's actually really funny. Armor itself isn't bad, but it's also not that useful either. Many lighter armor sets are actually quite good. Furthermore, equip load no longer impacts how effective your dodge rolls are. So in Dark Souls 1, your dodge rolls were affected by how much, how high your equip load percentage was, uh, but that's governed by another stat in this game. So although the although your equip load does affect the distance of your rolls, so it's not completely useless in that respect. But I personally don't think that Vitality is one of the game's stronger stats. I think actually separating it from, from uh, Endurance was a mistake. But with that being said, it's still not useless. It can still be useful for some characters. And the soft cap for this stat is 50 as well. Well, it's actually not 50. It's 49. And it, it has its own weird list of soft caps. It's very weird. It's a very bizarre stat. Um, but I don't really recommend it in general. But it's also not bad either if you want to use armor. Arguably, the main advantage to armor is that it increases your defenses, right? And in some cases, it can also increase your defenses to magic and other kinds of things like that. But the, arguably the biggest advantage to armor is it increases your poise, which is a stat that governs what kinds of attacks can stagger you, right? So if you have a lot of armor on, there are scenarios where you can get hit by an attack and then you can somehow keep swinging your weapon or you can, you're not, you're not phased by it, right? Something like that. And that's arguably the biggest reason to uh, level uh, to use armor. Uh, the main issue with that is, is that again, it's a huge stat investment for something that you should kind of be prepared to, to work around. But as this character, for example, obviously I'm using heavy armor and it's, it's working out for me pretty well, right? So you have to keep that in mind. Um, but it is a really, really key trade-off in this particular game. If you're using a physical character, whether or not you want to be using a flins ring or whether or not you want to be using the art, the poise from armor. And there are, there are lighter armor sets that are actually pretty good on poise too. So it's not like it's an either or kind of scenario. And I think that the heavier armors are kind of not worth it, basically. The next stat is attunement. This stat governs how many spells you can have ready to go at once. This is relatively self-explanatory and is an accessory stat to any kind of spell caster. It also increases your cast speed, which is again, really great for spell casters. Now, the last thing about this stat is that it also increases your agility which governs the number of invincibility frames you get on dodge rolls. So although it's very important to note that this next stat that I'm going to cover is the main stat to increase for that, it is in theory a small upside having to level up this stat as a spellcaster because you are getting some agility out of it as well. But other than that, it really only mostly increases the number of uh, spells you can attune and then how many spells you can cast. Uh, this one soft caps at a bunch of different weird po points like 30, 50, or 75. So it's a really weird stat as well. Okay, the last stat, the Piste de Résistance Adaptability. This gives you a bunch of random stuff like poison and bleed resistance. The main story with this stat is that it increases your agility, which increases your invincibility frames on dodge roll. Coupled with however much attunement you want, you'll want to reach an agility of somewhere in the neighborhood of 105, with the next main breakpoint being 111 agility, which would be difficult to achieve unless you have both either really high adaptability or really high attunement.
This is the magic miracle stat, which is why you can fast roll on Havel's armor in this game, uh, which makes no sense at all. Now, to be fair, armor would be terrible if I frames were tied to equip load in this game. So, ironically, this stat is both a destroyer and savior of armor in this game, I guess. If it weren't for this stat, then equipping armor would never be worth it, basically, because armor doesn't really do that much in this game. But the stat is also really mystifying to me. The premise of decoupling your dodge roll from your equip load makes no sense. Right, like a guy in big, huge, heavy plate armor probably rolls slower. Unless he's really trained or something, right? I mean, that just makes sense. It's not something that I feel like I have to explain, right? It's just, it's just, it's just intuitive, right? Just makes sense. And yet here we are talking about a stat that somehow has nothing to do with any of that. It's mystifying why they thought that this was fine. Although I can imagine that they created this as a way of attempting to balance armor and dodge rolls in PvP, I guess. So that anybody could hy hypothetically have a high number of iframes for that. Uh, but it's still the goofiest thing about this game and makes absolutely no sense at all. Uh, but I guess it's just part of the charm and of how weird this game is, so I can't complain about it too much. Okay, so those are the stats. Those are the support stats. And what's the big takeaway? Well, basically, you just have to hit the soft caps on adaptability, endurance, vigor, and vitality in that order, not counting any offensive stats you want or attunement. All in all, I actually like this level up system, and despite adaptability, it's actually not that different from Dark Souls. The main thing about this level up system is that it's bad for people who have no clue what's going on. They would have no clue about the soft caps, and the level up system would be overwhelming and confusing anyway. But this game is a magnet for terrible first time builds, which is probably caused by how convoluted the system is, how many choices you have despite having no real direction, and how many times people get distracted by this game's execution stuff, right? So. But, you know, this is a game series that's kind of known for being difficult, so it makes no sense for the level up system to be really obvious, right? It's uh, tough to complain about, I guess. But that's how it is with a lot of the best video games, right? These kind of obtuse foibles are actually what makes them so fascinating, right? So if you're a noob, they make no sense. But if you're an expert, they're really great, and they're really fun, and they're really interesting. So I think that is worth saying about this system. It's bad in some ways, but it's also good in other ways. Okay, so next we'll move on to Scholar of the First Sin itself, which is basically the same as Dark Souls 2. It's really an incredible anomaly of video games themselves. Sort of a remaster, but really not. Sort of more like a remix. Basically the difference between Pokemon Red and Pokemon Yellow. Which is not that big a difference. They're very similar games. I'd go so far as to say that Scholar is less different than Dark Souls 2 than Pokemon Red is to Pokemon Yellow. So the bar is really low. The differences are really minimal in most cases. The biggest difference is that the game runs at 60 frames per second, as opposed to the original Dark Souls 2, which only runs at 30 frames per second. This is barely noticeable, and it honestly could be a placebo, but it seems to make the game a little smoother. To me, though, that subtle amount of smoothness is essentially meaningless. Oftentimes, I respect older games for their bizarre clunkiness, so to me, the 30 FPS is just as charming as the 60 FPS from Scala of the First Sin. With that being said, you're still talking about a major reason to play Scholar over regular Dark Souls 2. Supposedly it also fixes some bugs, but I cannot either confirm or deny this, even though I've played both versions a pretty solid amount, so I'm not really sure how relevant that actually is for most people. Maybe it's a big deal, maybe it's not a big deal, maybe they patched Dark Souls 2 uh, so that it fixed some of those bugs anyway, I don't know. But I, I haven't had any major bugs in either game, so I'm not really convinced that that's all that meaningful. The bigger area of interest is in the gameplay differences, which can be briefly described as subtle. The main difference being that most areas have remixed enemies, either additional enemies or different enemies, or the enemies are in different spots, stuff like that. Truth be told, the overwhelming majority of these additional enemies are essentially meaningless. The first one you'll probably notice is this ogre at the beginning of Forest of Fallen Giants. To keep it simple, the truth is that it's essentially irrelevant for the entire video game. Most areas are blandly similar. Even some of the harder areas have been practically unchanged. This area at the end of Shrine of Amana is one of the areas, I think, that has been made much more difficult in Skull of the First Sin rather than in Dark Souls 2, and it is essentially identical. But I suppose, does it really make sense to complain about a relatively minor reshuffling of enemies? Maybe not. It's really more impressive than anything else that, that they remixed the game and then they didn't compromise the game in any kind of serious way. It plays more or less out exactly the same, which I guess is impressive. In short, the enemy placement differences are really neither an upside nor a downside. They don't really matter. The exception is that the enemies around Strayed's cell, well, they don't automatically attack you anymore, unlike in regular Dark Souls 2. 
And if that's the biggest difference that I can think of, well, it goes to show that the differences are really quite minuscule, right? Another fascinating difference is the shuffling of items around. In practice, there are actually almost no items at all moved around. Very few. Mostly it's key items. The main one of note being the Dull Ember, which is ordinarily found in the Iron Keep, but in Scholar of the First Sand, it can be located in the Lost Bastille. This is the most significant item difference as far as I can tell, as it allows you to infuse your weapons after killing the Pursuer in Forest of Fallen Giants, which is a huge boon for any character build that revolves around infusions, such as spellcasters or characters who don't benefit from scaling. So above all else, this is maybe the best argument for Scholar of the First Sin, this Dull Ember. There is tragically a downside to Scholar, however. Well, it's sort of a downside, it's actually also kind of an upside, and that's the infamous Fragrant Branch of Yore. These are a key item which unpetrifies enemies or NPCs turned to stone, and functionally they act similar to a key. Oftentimes these lead to treasure, but in one specific case they are required to advance in the game. Unfortunately, in Scholar, they added a large number of statues which simply block progress or access to bonfires. This is a problem if you reach one of these statues and somehow don't have a fragrant branch of yore, either because you spent them obtaining treasure or missed some of them along the way somehow. This is a crippling Achilles heel of Scholar of the First Sin and the main compelling argument for skipping it entirely and just playing the base game Dark Souls 2. Because if you ever end up in a scenario where you find one of these statues and you don't have a Fragrant Branch of Yore, that is really terrible. And there's like three or four additional statues or something, and they are really awful. Now, in all likelihood, you will have the, one of those Fragrant Branches of Yore's if you're looking around or you know where they are in advance. But it's still really lame. Still really, really terrible. And kind of balances out the the Dull Ember thing to make... Frigor, uh, to make uh, Skull of the First Sin a lot less attractive as an option. I would... I would go so far as to say that this is the strongest argument against Skull of the First Sin and a really strong argument for Dark Souls 2, but they're really very, very similar. The advantage to the Fragrant Branch of Yore situation is that technically you can get more Fragrant Branches of Yore sooner, okay? And the relevance of that is that there's one path in the game that requires a Fragrant Branch of Yore to go down. So you can technically unlock Pyromancy slightly earlier, and then also you could hypothetically get the treasure past that NPC uh, earlier as well so it's not completely terrible there is a really clear advantage to scholar of the first sin in that respect i think it depends on exactly where the, the fragrant branches are in the base game but i'm 90 percent certain that you can get like two to three more fragrant branches earlier in scholar of the first sin so even though it's really annoying when you run into a statue that's blocking like a bonfire uh you there you it does give you access to some other specific treasures earlier than you would obtain them in regular dark souls 2 so it's also an advantage but if you, you know it's one of these things where it's annoying enough that i do want to say that i really hate it um but for definitely for some characters there there may be some treasures that you would be able to get access to with scholar earlier than you would in regular Dark Souls 2. So in short, it doesn't actually really matter which version you play. Uh, to recap, uh, the increase in the Fragrant Branch of your statues is annoying, and yet obtaining the Dull Ember early is kind of nice. So if you plan to make use of weapon infusions, probably you want to play Scholar. So if you're maybe playing a Spellcaster, or you're playing a character that makes use of no scaling, you probably want to play Scholar. If not, you probably want to play Dark Souls 2. And it's kind of sad that Dark Souls 2 has any advantages over Scholar. I do really hate that. But again, they're basically the same. Thanks for watching.